favorite part of this whole presentation is where we talk about sensors. My favorite part is talking about sensors. So we're, talking, we're going to talk about sensors for automatic pedestrian doors. And, and really there are two different types of sensors used in our industry today. Primarily two different types of sensors. We have motion sensors and we have presence sensors. Okay, that's the two primary categories of sensors. And motion sensors are pretty much what the name implies. It's a motion sensor. And a motion sensor is a sensor that's designed to detect the movement of a person in the vicinity of the doorway and give a control signal to the power operated door. So it relies on motion. Let's, let's make sure that we understand the, the distinct differences. If, if I walk into a motion sensor zone, say there's a motion sensor at the top of a sliding door, and I walk into that motion sensor zone and stop and remain motionless, that sensor ceases to detect me and releases its signal to the door to do whatever it's supposed to be doing, whether it's an open signal or, or, or and typically it's an open signal. Did I see a question? Okay, I'm sorry. So motion sensor has to detect motion. And in the world of motion sensors, there's really two primary types of, of of uh, technology that's being used. We've got microwave, which uses uh, something called the Doppler effect to create a signal, meaning the motion sensor emits these Doppler waves of energy and it's expecting to get that energy reflected back to it by something moving. And when that object is moving, the rate of return of that microwave signal changes because as you walk either toward the motion sensor or walk away from the motion sensor, the reflectivity of your, of your body on those microwave pulses changes and that's what creates the signal. So, so when you stop in a motion detector zone, that microwave energy, the frequency of return changes or <coughs> stops and so it no longer detects you. So, Microwave, that's very, very simple. As simple as I can explain microwave. The other form of motion sensor uses active infrared. Active infrared is basically light, light beams at a, at, a, at a level that you can't detect with your, with your eye, but it, it, it emits light energy and it is also looking for reflected energy back, but light energy and not microwave energy. And when it detects motion, it signals, the, the, the uh, infrared motion sensor signals, causes the sensor to signal the door. So motion sensors rely on motion. Most common is microwave. There's still, uh, but there are some active infrared motion sensors being, uh, being used today. The other sensor that we use a lot in our industry today is a present sensor. And a present sensor is an electronic sensor designed to detect the presence of a stationary person in the vicinity of the doorway and give a control signal to the power operated door. So different from a motion sensor, if I step into a present sensor's detection zone and remain motionless, it's going to continue to detect me. Same as if you put a trash can or a plant or something into that, mo into that presence detector's zone, it's going to continue to detect that motionless object for a period of time. Most presence sensors have a selectable period of time on them from ranging from two seconds up to, let's just say, 180 seconds. Somewhere in that range, they're selectable. They have two or three choices of time so that if you, say you have it set for a two second relearn time. So if you place a trash can or if I move into a present sensor 
zone and I remain perfectly motionless and you have to be perfectly motionless, pretty hard to do. Uh, and, and you have that learn time set to two seconds and after two seconds it's going to drop, it's going to relearn me being in its, zone, in its zone and it's no longer going to signal. We'll talk about more of that in a minute. Uh, so in the world of present sensors, we have both door mounted type and overhead mounted type. So a door mounted present sensor is a present sensing device most commonly mounted on a moving door panel and typically used on swing doors, although they are also used on revolving doors. That's a door mounted, and as I said earlier, they're, sometimes they're across the top of the door, sometimes they're at the upper left hand corner or the hinge point of the door, sometimes they're across the mid rail, uh, but that's a, a door mounted present sensor. An overhead present sensor is a present sensing device most commonly mounted on the fixed door frame above the door opening. It can also include other door mounted presence devices with equivalent performance. So those are the two types of, of uh, present sensors that we have. And present sensors, uh, for, for the most part in our industry, present sensors are all active infrared. I don't know of another, I don't know of a present sensor that's being, somebody correct me, I don't know of a present sensor being used today in our industry that doesn't use active infrared. BEA are using um, lasers? They are. They are using laser. You're right. They're using laser technology in their door mounted uh, present sensors. You're right. You guys just I take, recently switched I to take BEA. that I take that back. Yeah, well we always use BEA products, but yes, you're right. They uh, and, and I, yeah, I'm not sure if Optex is sort of using, yeah, they, they I, might, but, but for the most part, what you're going to see in the field today is active infrared presence detection. You're, you're right. Laser detection is starting to become more popular. It's, it's already in use, uh, it's, and it's becoming more popular. It's like where Jimmy's from. It's in Europe, and I think we're seeing more of it. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Very good point, and thank you for pointing that out. <coughs> So, but, and, then the, and then the other uh, form of presence detector is known as a photo beam or a photoelectric beam. It's basically uh, an infrared light beam that's emitted from a transmitter and received at a receiver across a threshold, typically, or across uh, a set of guide rails at the, at the end of a set of guide rails on a swing door. And so, so long as uh, that beam is, is emitting and the receiver is receiving it, there's, there's, no, there's no signal. But as soon as you occlude that beam or interrupt that beam or stand in front of the beam, you break the beam, as it's typically called, then that uh, receiver portion of the, of the safe, safety beam or photo beam signals the door operator to do something. Typically hold open or sometimes don't open. It just depends on the application. But the purpose of, of really of, of, of going through this is to, is to just point out that the differences between motion and uh, present sensing devices. <coughs> the, uh, the other thing that's important to, uh, to realize, and I'm gonna, I have another slide, let me get to that slide. I gotta find it, John. This is out of uh, this. What we're looking at right now, no, is out of the uh, the Atom PowerPoint presentation. But, but oh, that is yes. I'm sorry. That's I'm I'm sorry. I'm okay. You're right. I just want to find the best slide to depict some of what I was talking about.
Okay, can we put this? Uh, okay. The other thing about sensors is they have very critical zone sizes that we have to pay attention to when we set these up. They don't come out of the box ready to install <coughs> with regard to zone sizes and sensitivity and things of this nature. They do not come out of the box ready to install without making some adjustments on them. So please make, make note of that. Uh, this slide demonstrates a typical activation zone area and this slide demonstrates a typical safety zone area. This is typically done with motion sensing. For the most part, the industry uses motion sensing for activation, but it could be present sensing. Doesn't have to be one or the other. For activation, because all we're doing is getting the door activated to either swing open or slide open. When it comes to safety zones, has to be presence. Can't be motion. Has to be presence detection when it, we're talking about a safety zone. And there's some very specific sizes that uh, must be adhered to as far as pattern sizes. And we'll talk about that more in detail, but just please be aware for the sake of this class that these zone sizes are adjustable. Not only the size of the pattern, not only is the size of this activation zone adjustable for, for you know, narrow or wide, depending on the application and depth, but it's also adjustable with regard to how sensitive it is once you're inside that zone. So if you could just, uh, no, no, not yet. So they're adjustable. They're all adjustable. And it's important to make sure that when you take it out of the box and put it up on the door, that you, your technicians uh, make sure that they're properly adjusted. And we'll talk about the details of that in the Atom class, but that they're properly adjusted for the door that they're being put on, as well as the safety detection zone. And this, by the way, is an example of a, of a present sensor that is a, a frame-mounted or, or header-mounted sensor, OK? So let's go to the slide that shows the door mounted sensors. <coughs> let's go to this. I want this one. I want that slide. Okay. This is an example of what a door mounted sensor zone looks like on a swing door. Meaning that here's the door panel, this is a swing door. And there is a door mounted sensor on each side of the door. And it doesn't matter where the sensor is located on the door. It could be at the top, it could be at the mid rail, it could be at the upper left hand corner uh, as, a, as a laser sensor on either side of the door. So long as it has the proper detection zones, meaning that uh, five inches from the face of the door on each side is, is the absolute Maximum distance. You, it can't be more than five inches from the hinge edge of the door. And it can't be more than one inch from the lead edge of the door. And all the sensors that are available today, including the laser sensors, are adjustable so that you create this size zone. So the idea is when the door is in the closed position up here, everybody's following me, you know, these, these, these door mounted zones travel with the door. So when the door is in the closed position, this zone that you see here is now going to be over here and prevents the door from opening on a person who might be in the swing path of the opening door. When the door is in the open position, this safety zone is now going to be over here and prevents that door from closing on a person in the swing zone. That's, a door, that's what the door mounted uh, safety sensor looks like, the pattern size. It doesn't matter what kind of sensor, what kind of door mounted sensor it is, it has to have at a minimum these detection zones. The zones can be much larger. Doesn't matter. You can make them, they can be as large as the environment will allow, meaning, you know, there's a guide rail here. There may be some, there may be some reason you can't have this zone larger because it sees, 
it will see the Coke machine or the guide rail or something, but that's the minimum size it has to be. And the controls have uh, switching abilities to accommodate for when the door reaches uh, the open checkpoint or the closed checkpoint to adjust adjust its speed so that it accommodates the, the sensor possibly seeing uh, something in its path. I have a question about um, the, uh, the mats. I've never actually uh, messed with mats, uh, mat sensors. Um, is there a benefit to them? I know it's, it's more work to put in, but I mean, is there something that I would, you know, persuade my clients to have a mat floor well, in this day and age? Well, mat, mats, Maybe, maybe. You know, mat, mats have become less and less popular over the last 20 years. They used to be, you know, the prime, one of the primary methods of causing an activation signal or providing a safety signal. They used to be the prime. The, they, I think they have more downsides than upsides, personally. So if you install a mat in a, uh, in a very, very cold climate area, you know, when ice and snow melts, it, 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 you know, the water creeps and gets under the mat. Right. And then it freezes the, that night. So then the water expands into ice and causes the mats to create a false signal. So that's just one example uh, of, of, a, of a problem that we, that we see with mats. Another thing is mats are susceptible to damage by heavy carts or, or something going over them. Uh, so, um, so they're still in use today. We, we still see uh, mats being used primarily in security revolving door applications, although even those are now going to overhead uh, electronic sensors instead of mats. But mats are still in use. Um, about, uh, I specifically ask because of toddlers and uh, short people. Right. Uh, like under, what is the standard, uh, 28? Uh, so, yeah, so let's go back to the uh, ANSI standard, John. Uh, that I had <coughs> up. I think it's 28, yeah. It's not, yeah, it's on the other, uh, it's on the other, uh, it's on the power, uh, it's on, there, there we go. There okay, so, so, so yes. So, so the sensitivity of a motion sensor shall detect a 28 inch minimum high person moving at a rate of six inches per second. So, so yes, so it, it, we, this, the industry has adopted 28 inches as that child, okay? Right or wrong, that's what it is. Um, does that answer your question? I'm just thinking in terms of, you know, when, when you uh, sell to certain uh, facilities, you know, I mean, some facilities don't have toddlers entering, entering them, so sure, you know, present sensors, uh, sorry, door mounted and uh, <coughs> overhead mounted sensors are applicable there. Maybe, though, in um, malls, mm -hmm. that with those would be something to pitch, or would that not be applicable? Well, no, it could be, but mm -hmm. always re remember when we get into these to the uh, to the ANSI guidelines, mm -hmm. the ANSI guidelines always referring to minimums and maximums. So while the, the, the minimum height person it must detect is 28, most sensors are capable of getting much closer to the floor. And so that's the minimum. So if, you're, if you have an application and you want to use a door mounted sensor, I know for a fact that the laser sensors that you referred to can, can, can get down to within probably six inches of the floor and detect. So, so you can use that application. But once again, the ANSI standards talk about minimums and maximums. So as I said earlier about the size of the zone, it can be a lot bigger. There's no restriction on how big you make the zone. It's just some restriction on how small you can make the zone. But you, you've done those installations before where you used both in parallel. You can use both in parallel, absolutely. It wasn't like considered overkill or anything. It, 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 always consider your application. Always consider the traffic that's going to be using that door. If you have an, an old folks home, I, I use it, I'm probably not politically correct, but anyway, uh, what do you call them? You know, old folks home. Or, or someplace where you know you're gonna have very slow moving, frail people, very slow moving, frail people. 
you clearly, you want the door to open and close slower. You want the time delays to be longer. You want the detection zones to be bigger. I mean, th that's, you know, whereas if you have a high volume, uh, you know, airport door or something, you may not, I'm not saying you shouldn't, I'm just saying you, you may not want to get the detection down to within six inches of the floor. Uh, I know it's boring, but, you know. <laughs> uh. You don't want stray cats opening the door, though. Right. So, and, and, that's, and that's why part of the Atom program that you're going to go through starting tomorrow focuses on, you're the installer, you're the technician, you know, it's kind of your duty, your, it's your responsibility to make sure that you make that doorway safe before you walk away from it, you know, so, okay. I uh, wanted to get over to, back to, let's see, let's, yeah, I wanted to go to uh, the slide door section where they have the, scroll down. Keep going, it's towards the end. There we go, this is the start. <coughs> let's, go back to, let's go back to, um, let's go to that one there for now. <coughs> Okay, so here, this is, this is a, a visual aid example of, of uh, overhead sensors on a, on a slide door. And the part that you see in the, in the red grid really, for the sake of this slide, represents the present sensing zone. And the other thing I was going to talk about, and I had it in my notes and I didn't, is that, so now we're talking about slide doors, okay? And in today's world, Almost all sensors that are being used today <coughs> for slide door activation include activation and presence in the same sensor. Like that sensor up there that's up on that door has an activation zone and a presence zone, okay? They're built into the same sensor, so you don't have to have, you know, two sensors. It's all, it's all one. So this kind of represents what the presence zone would look like uh, for a sensor like that, meaning that it has to project out from the face of the door a certain distance and it has to be within, there's that 28 inches again, of the floor. So okay if you bring it down to six inches of the floor, if, it, you, know, if you can, uh, but that's the minimum you could have. And then what's not seen here is what you, the activation zone would be you know, farther out, so that as you approach the door, the activation zone and that activation zone in today's sensors might be microwave or it might be active infrared, depending on the manufacturer, that causes the activate signal to get the door open. And then the presence zone keeps the door open while a person is going through the, th uh, through the doorway, across the threshold. And there are, uh, the, some of the newer sensors today have even a more advanced technology that, you know, that looks crossways through the, through the threshold. Uh, uh, Stanley uh, makes a sensor they call the Stanguard that actually looks through the threshold from one side of the door. You know, there are a lot of different types of overhead uh, sensors. And when we get into the, uh, tomorrow we'll talk about specifically how they have to behave and what they have to do from a performance standpoint to make sure the door doesn't close. But the point really of today is just to say different types of sensors out there, motion presence, Critical adjustments for size, detection zone, sensitivity within the detection zone, things like that. So is it, uh, is it three inches or five inches that's the max for presence? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Yes, sir. We're gonna, uh, because the, the way the ANSI standard is written is that if this detection zone, if the, from the edge of this detection zone to the face of the sliding door, which is, which is this represents represented by this line here uh -huh. if that if that di if that distance is no greater than three inches three inches mm -hmm. and you can verify that mm -hmm. then you do not need additional hold open beams okay but if that distance is between three and five mm -hmm. if this three. distance is over three up to five 
You got to get safety beams. Then you have to add safety beams, and that's going to be part of, like I said, part of the Adam presentation. But, uh, but yeah, that's that's awesome. important. And and part of the reason, and this is and this is a Horton class, and this, so we can talk about Horton because tomorrow we can't talk about Horton, but we can talk about Horton today. One of the reasons that Horton Automatics has never listen, Robert, marketing man. <laughs> One of the reasons that we've never taken these photo beams off of our slide door package, even though they cost, and we have sensor technology today that can be within three inches of the face of the door, or even through the doorway, is because verifying that three, or three to five isn't that easy to do. I mean, it can be done. Yeah, and yeah, photo beams are cheaper than lawyers, but they're, they're inexpensive, they're reliable, they're easy to check, and it gives us that added layer of safety that we, that we wouldn't have if we didn't put the beams on it, and somebody, nobody in this room would ever do this, but somebody put a sensor up there and didn't check the detection zone to make sure that it wasn't too far away from the face of the door, because if it is, then a person can walk in from the side of the door. The door's already open because the last person went through. The door's still open. This person comes in from the side. The overhead presence detection never detected that person because it was somebody had adjusted it out here, and the door starts to close as soon as she steps into the threshold. Hits her, knocks her down. She breaks her hip and dies six months later. It happens. It happens, and I've got, I've got lawsuits to prove it. Okay, so the, the, the takeaway from, from this uh, part of the presentation is, is that there are a lot of different types of sensors, but it's very, very important to be sure that you know the type of sensor you're installing and that you're, or you're, or you're uh, working on and that you make sure that it is properly adjusted for the application. Okay. Yes, sir. So when that sliding door is going closed, we've got a, a thirty-pound bump, thirty-pound bump, like sensor or something that detects. I think I know where you're going with this. Yeah. I'm just wondering, is that a sensor when you're if it actually hits somebody and it, it says okay, thirty pounds, it's supposed to stop. Well. Horton doesn't, Horton doesn't use a sensor on the edge of the door, but what we do have is an adjustable closing force, okay? We have an adjustment in our control that lets us limit how much force the leading edge of the door generates when it's closing, okay? And the ANSI standard says that the maximum force is 30 pounds. It's okay if it's 20 or 15 or 10, they do it by PSI, right? Yeah, 30 pounds of force. Yeah. It's okay for it to be less. The problem with making it way less, for the most part, is you get pressure differentials on a hotel or a building somewhere, and you get so much wind pressure or stack pressure against the door that if you have it set at very, very low, just the sheer force of the, of the pressure differential is enough to limit, to restrict that door's ability to close and it's, it, it interprets it as an obstruction and cause it to go open. So you have to set it high enough so that in, in the winter time when you have more stack issues to deal with, it, get, it can overcome that, but not so high that it exceeds 30 pounds. So the, kind of the happy medium is somewhere in the 20 to 25 pound range is what I've, what I've found for our products. You can get them to 15 on inside doors easily. If you have an exterior door that might have a stack issue, you're probably going to need to set it around 20. So it's not really considered a sensor. Right. Hort now, I, I've seen them. We've toyed with them. There's a, whole, there's a whole slew of issues that go along with lead edge sensors. Because you have to have a wire or you have to have a way to sig uh, transmit signal and get power to this. You know, it, so there's a lot of other things. I don't know if other companies use them or not. Because on a slide door, you have to have a, a transfer to get that signal to the control. The only place I know of is like on my garage door at home. Over right? When it's coming yeah. down when it's yeah. you know, supposed to be Yeah, overhead doors have a lot down there. Yeah, they have a safety edge. And we've toyed with that same technology. Yeah. 
but once again, getting the signal from the lead edge of the door up to the control. We used to use cord reels. Yeah, we used to use old-fashioned light reels, you know, that you drop light cord reels or a curly cord just kind of hanging back there. I mean, we've tried a lot of different things, but the, what we call our reversing sensitivity, and Jim's going to talk about that in a little while, our re reversing sensitivity gives us the ability to adjust that door so you can put your hand out and stop it easily. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, and the other thing that comes into account also, uh, Barry, is closing speed. So slowing the door down so that it doesn't close too fast. We'll talk about that tomorrow too, but the maximum closing speed for the most part in our industry is a maximum of one foot per second door travel. You'll see six inches per second when you get into low energy slide doors, but for full power sliding doors, maximum closing speed is one foot per second. The heavier the door, the slower it's going to be. There's a formula that we'll talk about. So if you have a door that weighs, you know, say 200 pounds, it's going to have to close slower than one foot per second. It might be somewhere, you know, eight inches per second or, or something like that. But so a lot of these things come into play along with detection zones and hold open time delay and signage to make the door safe. Any other questions on sensors? He's going to cover that re reversing sensitivity because I was curious. I never really messed with them because I always put my hand and can tell like this isn't going to take somebody out like a tank. But is left less obstruction or is right more obstruction? Like I, you're going well, to yeah, right increases in sensitivity. Right increases in sensitivity. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I think the last time I was here, you guys gave me a. Um, you gauge. had your own. Pr you had your own pressure gauge. gauge right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, made specifically for yeah. this. Yeah. Well, they're, they're available. I mean, we still have them. Oh, I thought you guys made that. <laughs> no, we had it made oh, yeah. by a company in Colorado called Howard, the Howard Company, and they make them for elevator, elevator people and a lot of That's the stick? Yeah. It's useful. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's really useful. Yeah, those are yeah. awesome. I carry it with me all the time when I travel on an airplane. And I just take it out. Even though I have pre-check, I just take it out and lay it in the bin because they're always going to want to see it, you know. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a stick. See, yeah. <laughs> but but everybody, uh, that's interesting. How many people? How many technicians carry a force gauge with them in their truck? Okay, those of you that don't have one need to get one. You need to get one. You like to test the breakout on the slide panel. Te the test the breakout. The max fifty. Yeah. It is. Yeah, door pressure gauge. We have them, uh, and we we sell them. You know, yeah, they each need to have one. Did I, did I miss anything on sensors? Okay, so listen, really, that was, that was all I had on, on sensors for today. But please, we're, we're going to have a lot of time for questions and stuff. So please, if you think of something, um, don't hesitate to call on me. Jim, are you up next? So has anybody come up with a, a way of avoiding people getting hit when the door's open? When they're opening. Okay, so, so the question is, how do we avoid people from getting hit when the doors are opening? Okay, I don't have an, I don't, yeah, a sliding, a sliding door is opening. So you mean they, you know, and listen, I've got lawsuits on that too. Yeah, I do. Or, or, no, gra Grandma's standing right here having a smoke waiting for her son to come around the car. Mm -hmm. You know, she's standing here, and, and, and somebody walks up to the door, and the door opens and, and hits her, knocks yeah. her down. Or the guy's over here on a payphone, and this is an actual case. He's on a payphone. He's got his hand like that on the glass. The door comes open and hurts his hand, you know, lawsuit. So here's the answer. Here's the answer. The couple, there's a couple of approaches to that. One approach is to use, Sorry. yeah, Sorry. <laughs> one approach is to use a sensor above the stationary panel, a presence sensor, a small presence sensor, light curtain type sensor above the stationary panel on each side so that, if it's a bipart, so that if that area is occupied, 
it prevents the door from opening. That's one way, of, and, and our controls, our controls have that. The problem with that is, is that if somebody steps into that area when the, when the door is opening, causes the door to slow down or stop, then regular pedestrians who are going through the door correctly run into the door. And then you've got a whole different set of problems. Okay, so, but that's available and we can do that. We have the ability with our controls today to do that. A better solution, a better solution are some of the newer breed of sensors that are out today that are designed, I mean the sensor that looks just like this one that's available today has the ability of projecting a, a pattern 16 feet wide. So the theory is you can't get to that area without the door being open. So the idea is to, is to use the type of sensor that covers the entire face of the door with detection so that as you, as you would approach, the door would start opening and, and get open before you could go get over here and, and be standing in the path of the door. So that would be a motion sensor? It's a presence sensor. Oh, it's a presence, yeah, it's presence a sensor, sensor, yeah. Presence. Yeah, and that, that uh, a sensor like that, in fact, that sensor that's on that door can do that. It has the technology to provide that size pattern. You know, we have this one toned down, so you've got to walk up to it and put your hands in front of it, just because we have so much cross traffic in here all the time that we have it turned down. But so does that answer your question OK? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, because that does come up. I mean, I was working on one, I forgot that. Yeah. Well, we had, and Mark probably remembers this, we had, we had one of those, not on this door, but that other, the red door that leads out to our shop. Uh, we had that on the door, and one of our employees was coming through the door in a hurry and ran into the door and, and you know, I don't remember, you know, got upset and got hurt and made a, made a, I don't remember whatever happened. You remember that? Yeah, I'm trying to remember, I, I can't remember who it was, but anyway. So we've, yes, we've tested it, we, we have it available, but the better alternative is a sensor that that's wide enough to cover the entire face of the door. And I know some of the sensors have a, like a redirection capability to where your presence also activates your door. Well, the question, what he said is that some sensors ha are set up so that the presence zone can activate the door. Yeah. And, and that's true. Most of them do. Okay. Most of them do. You, you mean even if the activation sensor is not activated? Yeah. If you come yeah. The yes. Door, they, yes, they typically do. They typically do. John, I've got a quick question uh -huh. on that example <coughs> where the activation zone was on one side and the safety zone was on the other. That's a one-way door. That particular slide was a one-way door, yes. And then if, if it would have been a two-way door, then there would have been an additional activation zone beyond the safety zone to have the door open before the pedestrian got into the safety zone. That also requires longer guide rails to help channel these people uh, so that they actually go through that secondary activation zone before they get into the uh, safety zone on a two-way traffic swing door. But a two-way traffic swing door is kind of a no-no. I mean, it's, you can do it, technically you can do it, and it's, it, it's, it's code compliant as long as it's set up right. But as a general rule, we discourage customers from doing two-way traffic through a swing door. It's just it's just got too many possible too many possible negative side effects. Yeah, the SEL is a, a different animal altogether. Yeah, it's a different animal altogether. Yeah, we're not we're not sure what it is. <laughs> if you want a two-way traffic flow there through a swing, would you recommend a double egress? Uh, well, it depends on the application. Double egress doors are typically used in hospital corridors. That's where you almost, that's, I mean, for the most part, that's where double egress doors right. are used. Hospital they're corridors, you know, they're, they're big and wide. They're typically a minimum eight foot wide pair of doors. Corridors are 10 feet wide usually. And so th that's one alternative. Uh, that's one alternative, but it uh, doesn't have to be double egress. And the thing, let's talk about double egress for a second. So, so it's important to note, put my slide back up, or too late. Go to double egress. <coughs> yeah.
Here we go, right there. Yeah. So this is a typical double egress set of doors. Uh, and this is the double egress set of doors set up for full power. So you see the conglomeration of sensor requirements and whatnot. That's why most double egress hospital corridor doors are low energy because you take away all the red and green and you're good to go. But a, a double egress door, and the thing to keep in mind is that a double egress door never has a vertical mullion in between. If there's a vertical mullion between these two door panels, it's two singles. That's the takeaway. It's two singles. A double egress never has a vertical mull between them, and they have to activate simultaneously. Who said that? Thank you. They have to activate simultaneously. You can't activate just one or the other door independently. They have to activate simultaneously. Okay. Good question, though. You're Mo talking, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Mo most of the two-way traffic doors that I've seen on swing doors, most of the two-way traffic swing doors that I've seen, besides double egress and hospital corridors, would be pairs of doors. Large enough opening to accommodate traffic flowing in both directions. It just becomes a, once again, kind of a sensor nightmare, guide rail nightmare. It just, it, you have to add so much stuff to it. It just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not practical. And they're all, uh, what's it, what was it you called it? Active, uh, active knowledge? Knowing act. Knowing act. They, they all have to be that way, right? Low energy. Low energy. All low energy do. In hospital doors? Yeah, if, if, this, if this was the hospital corridor, okay, don't pay attention to other stuff that's on this because I'm just, okay, because this is for a specific application. This is a hospital corridor, and this is a very common, they're everywhere, thousands of them. If you make it low energy, then you have to have a push plate, a card reader, or some type of annoying act and they have to operate very slowly with very low force to be, you know, to be low energy. Okay, I want to make sure we're clear on that uh, because... Sorry. Well, no, that's okay. Um, uh, maybe well, I'd... Hospitals specifically, hospital corridors, you do not use low energy. No, you can. You, 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 most of them are. Most of them are. They are, but it doesn't have to be. Okay. It could be full power, and in that case, if it was full power, then you have, to, you have to use all these sensors you see here, okay, if it's full power. You have to have an activation zone that's way out beyond the edge of the door to get the doors open so that you get here before the door, before the, you get in the way of the door, okay? And actually what you're seeing here is there's an imaginary line here that divides method A from method B. So method B uses an activation zone that's very wide and then second, another activation zone here, and then door-mounted sensors on the door, okay? Whereas method A is an activation zone just here, so that as a person is walking this way, they activate the door before they, before, so the door gets open before they get in the, in the path of the door, and this activation zone can be reduced because the door is swinging away from them. So you have a method A at the top and a method B at the bottom. Any more questions? Yes, sir. When is it preferred to use a door mount versus an overhead sensor? You know, that's really a, a distributor's choice. Architect may specify it to be a certain way. A customer may specify it to be a certain way. It's, it's, it, if you're asking, if you're asking my opinion, my personal opinion is with today's really good door mounted sensors, I'd probably, recommend door-mounted sensors on a, on a double egress pair like that. What about generally? I can see with the double egress because it... There's no general... I mean, every sensor out there going where it's going to be, you can... Go, go to the overhead, uh, double egress, double overhead. Other way. 
Oh, back up. I think that was it. There we go. That's it. Put that one up. Okay, so here, this is... All the activation has to be within the opening of the door. Once you're past that opening, there's no... Huh? Yeah, he did. <laughs> and he, he knows it, so that's good, yeah. So this is an example of the same double egress pair of doors, except this is not using door mounted sensors, this is using overhead mounted sensors. And you see, once again, there's a method A and a method B, but you have to have a detection, safety detection zone on this side of the pair of the double egress doors and then you have to have activation out beyond well beyond the lead edge of the door so that as traffic is approaching the doors have a, a time to get open before the pedestrian gets into the path of the door and once again when you say you know my opinion in my opinion the, the problem it's just easier to set up with door mounted sensors because trying to find a place to mount this sensor can be a problem. Ten feet away from the door. Yeah. yeah. But but um, if you do it that way, that's how it has to be done. So. They wouldn't be a header on this. Yes. They it, would not. Be. There would be. There would be. Right. So what would be the problem with one of those? Well, because putting putting an activation sensor on a header. Uh, on the header getting and having it get way out here is typically these are mounted in a ceiling or something to have the activation zone out here. Okay. It's not really a, it's not a terrible downside to it uh, uh, except that you know while the door is closing, while the door is closing safety sensors have to be locked out. Jim's going to talk about that in his but you have to lock out the safety sensor. So while the door is closing, you have to lock out the signal from the safety sensor because the safety sensor would actually detect the movement of the door under it. Well, it would also, it, the activation sensor would also see the door if it was mounted on the header. Okay? And you don't want to lock out the activation, otherwise the door won't open. So you have to get that activation sensor out away from the arc of the door so that it doesn't detect the door movement. It's just, like I said, two-way traffic is always a pain through swing doors. <laughs> it just is. <laughs> okay. So next up is the 2150 uh, video. All that, all that great. And so it, when it comes in, it goes through a, through a, a, a handler, basically, and it, it assigns a number to it. So leave your cell phone number so that we know, and the problem, so that we can be geared up and ready to go to talk to you and so that we're not fishing around and wasting time whenever we do return your call. If you don't hear from us in an hour, then, um, then buzz back and, and then see if you can get a hold of Jim or one of the other, because like John said, if one of us could be in a plane, eating, um, driving, you know, going to a location or something like that. But if you don't hear from us within an hour, then, then definitely get touch back with us. Right. Um, so this video, uh, we're, we're playing it because there are there are thousands of C2150 slide door controls in the field today, and I think this will answer a lot of your questions and concerns about about it. So if you want to go ahead and uh, run the video, John, uh, make sure we get the volume up. Adam, the American Association of Automatic Door Manufacturers all installation and adjustments should be made in accordance with Horton Automatic's installation instructions and ANSI A156.10 American National Standards Institute for Power Automatic. Be sure, there are three fuses. There's F1 fuse, there's F2, and F3. They're labeled on the, on the power supply very clearly, and they're all 3.15 amp slow blow fuses. F1 protects the incoming power supply, F2 is uh, tied directly to the motor supply, and F3 is tied directly to the low voltage side of the control of the power that supplies power for our accessories. So we get a lot of calls from guys who have an F blown F2 fuse, which is on the motor side of the drive, 
because they've got a motor that's either got low resistance or they've got some other problem in the motor drive or in the motor. And so let's be sure we are sure, sure we're aware that we got we got three different fuses. They do three different things on the power supply, but they're all the same fuse. They're all rated the same. So you should have some of these uh, 3.15 amp slow blow fuses in your toolbox. So F2 is the motor F2. supply. F2 is a, yes, sir. F2 is for, F2 is for the motor. So it, it, it and see it's coming in as AC. It goes through the rectifier and comes out as DC. Right. Okay. And F3 was the sensors. The 24 volt for the sensors, or any of the other accessory items that you may want to power from that power supply. Right. Yeah. And so okay. you can you can catch a lot of your problems early on just by making sure you check your fuses. Now the next part of the video goes on to show how you can check it uh, at, the, at the five pin uh, plug going to the control. And that, that's what I always wanted to point out. Okay. Yeah, and whenever you're, when you're checking that, when you go right over to the plug, one, two, three, four, five, those wires that are in the, in the, in the, in the video, it's showing you to plug, do intercept that. You don't have to disconnect it. Leave it and put, okay. your, put your probes, run your probes right through the back of the plug. Leave everything in there and then run your probes right through the back of the plug and then look that way. Don't disconnect anything. Because okay. it was working previously, so don't start, you know. Taking it apart. Don't start taking it apart. Just use your meter. And, um, and like Jim said, you better have your book. You're gonna call him. <laughs> and then go right into one and two. And look for the voltage that's supposed to be there. Go right to three and four. And look for the one and two should have a Around yeah. 120 to 130. Yeah, I think they pulled out. Right, so you're going to see you're going to see rectified DC voltage on that on that end of the plug. What um, I always do is when I get a guy and he tells me it's zero or two or three or four or five, I have him move to three and four. You know, he's got he's got an LED and he's got a display, so we know that's good. And if he tells me he's got zero at three and four too, I know he's got a meter issue. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, if it's turned so on, then, yeah. That's kind of a check. The other thing that and this is kind of off, off topic, but when I have guys checking uh, resistance, there's uh, resist resistors right below that plug. One of them is a, is a 10 ohm. I have them unplug the controls and go to ohms and look at those resistors, and if they tell me it's 10, then I know that, you know, there's a lot of guys don't know how to use them either. So that's, that's something I think I would check. <coughs> Twenty-four volts AC is available at CN3 off the transformer. This supply is connected to the control through the C3959 harness, which connects the power supply to the control. The plugs on this harness provide excellent access points to test the supply. It is preferable to test at the control end of the cable so as to rule out the harness itself as a problem. To check the motor supply, insert the probes of a VOM meter set to DC voltage in the back of pins one, white, and two, brown, of the connector. The meter should show about 120 volts DC between these points. To check the low voltage, insert the probes of a VOM meter set to DC voltage in the back of pins three, red, and four, black, of the connector. The meter should read between 27 and 32 volts DC. Testing the supply of these points is a shortcut to removing and testing the fuses. If either of these tests fail, the associated fuses should be checked. Now, what he was talking about there is when you look at those fuses, that whenever you're checking it like this, you've got a load against the fuse. And so the fuse is either going to be open or closed. We've seen a lot of times when, when guys break the fuse out and then check it with an ohm meter, it looks good. They plug it back in, they have no voltage. Well, that, when that meter so lightly loads the fuse that he's, he's back okay again. Mm -hmm. And he has kind of self-healed himself. Yep. And then they plug it back in and all of a sudden, I still don't have any voltage, what's going on here? Probably got a, probably got a bad fuse. And so if you do, take that fuse, put it out there on, on, and then smash it into a fine paste with a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's a bad fuse. And a lot of times what you'll see is they'll open up under the cap and you can't see it. Yeah. And, um, and so definitely throw it away. But um, you'll see that sometimes yeah. you put it right back into the circuit. Uh-huh. Yeah, they'll, they'll pry it out of one end of it 
and then check it across, and he looks okay. They put him back in, they still don't have any voltage. Well, I got a bad power supply. Oh, I'm not quite sure about that yet. Yeah, there's something else that you can do that's kind of a Not a lot of people do. You can go to the AC bolts with your meter and go to each end of the fuse. If you see voltage, the fuse is bad because if the fuse is good, the electron can take the path of the least resistance through the fuse and you'll see zero when you're in the um, AC scale looking across the fuse. Everybody catch that? Everybody yeah. understand that? Okay. If the display and LEDs are illuminated, it can be assumed the F1 and F3 fuses are functional and low voltage circuits need not be tested. The microprocessor is the main component and workhorse of the C2150. It is the largest chip on the board and contains the microprocessor with the program loaded on it. It is easily identified by the label affixed to it. Early software required different chips for linear belt drive operators. Version 1 software was used on linear operators, while version 2 was used on belt drive applications. Version 10 can be used for either application. Two seven-segment displays provide information to the user. This array can display function codes to communicate what the control is actually doing, programmable parameters which can be changed by the user, and error codes to alert the user of a problem. Occasionally, a decimal point is used to indicate specific information, such as a stroke that exceeds the capacity of the display, or to show the control is in the program mode. Adjacent to the display is the lock LED and the lock monitor LED. Most of the inputs on the C2150 are connected to and powered from the 16 terminals at CN2. 24 volt DC is available at pin 1 and pin 5 and is marked with one long and two short dashed lines. All common connections are marked with a trailing decimal point. Pins 4, 7, 9, 11, and 15 are commons and are electrically the same. They can be used as negative terminal when providing power for accessories, or they can be used to complete the circuit for the inputs. Everybody get that? So all, when you see that period back here, behind it, number 11, 9, 7. And what I have seen guys do is they'll take one large wire that's about six or eight inches long and land it under number 11, say, and then they'll bring all their commons to that yeah. and land jump. and jump everything to just that one. So all of them are are the same. And so they can bring all those commons from the motion detectors, everything into that one, put it under one wire cap. Yeah, we do that when we got a bunch of You've got bunches of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So anything with a dot at the end of it is a common. That is correct. Okay. Interior activate device is connected to pin 2 of CN2 and on the control. When this input is active, the green LED will illuminate and a signal will be sent to the processor. <coughs> the exterior activate device is connected with pin 3 of CN2. When this input is active, the red LED will illuminate and a signal will be sent to the microprocessor. The safety beam device is connected with pin 6 of CN2. When this input is active, <coughs> the yellow LED will illuminate and a signal will be sent to the microprocessor. The toggle switch is connected with pin 8 of CN2. When the toggle switch and optional breakout switches are closed completing the toggle circuit, the green LED will illuminate and send a signal to the control indicating the door is in use. The closed monitor switch is used on belt drive units and is connected to pin 10 of CN2. When the door is closed, this switch is closed, and completing the circuit will illuminate the yellow LED and send a signal to microprocessor that the door is closed. An optional partial open switch can be connected to pin 12 of CN2. When partial opening is desired, this switch can be closed which completes the circuit, illuminating the green LED and sending a signal to the microprocessor that the door is only to open part way. A decimal illuminates on the display indicating a partial open is selected. A one-way switch can be connected to pin 13 of CN2. When one-way traffic is desired, this switch can be closed, which completes the circuit, 
eliminating the yellow LED and sending a signal to the microprocessor that the door is only to respond to interior motion detectors. An auxiliary active switch can be connected to pin 14 of CM2. This switch can be a maintained contact type for hold open, for position key switch, etc., or a momentary contact from a card reader or a device. <coughs> this input is the only input that will open the door in any mode that is selected. When auxiliary activate is desired, a closed switch completes the circuit, illuminating the red LED, sending a signal to the open door to remain open until the signal is released. Terminal 16 of CN2 is the day-night input of the control. This input is connected to terminal 15, common, at the factory to default the control of the day mode. Removing the jumper causes the static setting of the control to shift from 2D, which is a two-way day mode, to 2N, which is two-way night mode. Pause it for a minute. Yeah, pause it, so that back it up for a minute. Okay, before you do that, uh, the first section in y'all's books is a 2150. Uh, I see a lot of you are not, uh, you don't have it open. If you're going to make notes to follow along or whatever, all of, all of the information that you're seeing in this video is there, and you might want to make some notes or, or follow along uh, if you want to. When I put these uh, <coughs> manuals together, I, I tried to put in there what I would want, you know, basically, if I was out doing service and installation work right now. So you've got, you know, the 2150, which is the older slide door control. There's a ton of them out there. We've been making them for years. 4190 is the current swing door. And then we've got, you know, the, the 3150, we're going to have both types of revolvers and the sensor monitoring boards. So that's, you know, that's a book that could go in your truck. And I hardly ever get any calls on the older stuff, the 7160-3s and 4160. So most everything <coughs> that you should be running into, you should have covered in that, in that little manual we put together. You had something, John? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, reiterate one other thing. When the, at the beginning of this video, we indicated that this was uh, a version 10 software on this control. I'd like to just, for those of you that don't, aren't aware, and the way Horton has always done things is every time we release a newer version of software for most of our controls, especially uh, in this series, every new version will retrofit almost everything else we've ever done. This video is based on version 10 and it made reference to the closed monitor switch, which was um, this LED, and, and um, nine and ten. It made reference to a closed monitor switch that is used on was was used on belt drive operators. Version eleven, which is the the, the latest version of twenty one fifty, doesn't require a closed monitor switch. We eliminated the need for a closed monitor switch on belt drives in version eleven. So that's not pointed out in this video, but it's important to note. So if you have, if you happen to work on a door that doesn't, a belt drive door that doesn't have a closed monitor switch, it's probably going to be version 11. Or if you retrofit a version 11 control to an older, one of the older belt drive doors, it no longer needs the closed monitor switch. You can leave it connected, it just ignores it. Yeah. Now, one quick thing on this way. When we set this thing up, one through four was for your beams. Five, six, and seven, I said beams, for your motion detectors. Five, six, and seven was power, common, and signal for your beam. Eight and nine was for your toggle. 10 and 11 was closed monitor. And then the uh, partial, one way, all that shared a common with number 15. from 2D, which is a two-way day mode, to 2N, which is two-way night mode. Three programming input buttons are present on the C2150 control. The buttons are up, down, and set. These buttons are sometimes used in conjunction with reset or power up for diagnostic purposes. 
jumper blocks JB1A and JB1B are used to force the micro switches to carry more current when the control is powering a linear drive operator. The jumper block should be connected vertically in linear drive units. In belt drive applications, the jumpers are placed on only one pin so that no connection is made. CM1 is where the encoder harness is connected for belt drive units. CN11 is where the micro switches harness is connected for linear units. CN4 is the connector for Horton Auto Lock. CN8 is the connector for the motor. CN3 is the connector for the power fail open close module. We will now look at a normal run cycle. When the control is in the idle mode, a static code will be displayed. 2D indicates that the door is in the fully automatic mode. 1D indicates that the door is limited to one-way traffic. In this mode, the exterior motion detector will not activate the door if fully closed, but is functional for hold open and recycle after the door has been opened. 2N indicates that the door is in the two-way night mode. Motion detectors are ignored for activate, hold open, and recycle. Only the safety beams will prevent the door from closing. Input from the auxiliary input and the down button are the only signals that will open the door in the night mode. When a partial open signal is received, a decimal point is added to the existing static code. When an open signal is received, the control leaves the static mode and starts a run cycle. OS is displayed and the door opens to the open checkpoint at a speed that is selected by the open speed parameter. At this point, the control calls for motor braking, which is indicated by three horizontal lines on the control. Braking is necessary to slow the door prior <coughs> to full open because it is desirable to clear the door from the opening as quickly as possible to facilitate traffic. When the control determines that the deacceleration is complete, the braking signal is removed and the control goes to open check speed until open cushion is reached. Depending upon open speed and the size of the door, deacceleration can extend through the open check portion of the opening cycle and you will not see the open check display at all. Open check speed is controlled by the open check parameter. Open cushion takes place in the last one inch of stroke. The purpose of open cushion is to drive the door slowly but firmly into the bumper. Open cushion speed is controlled by the open cushion parameter. When open cushion is complete, the control displays the cycle code. The first code given will be for the input that activated the door initially or caused it to recycle while closing. This could be interior activate, exterior activate, safety beam, or auxiliary activate. If the door is not being held open by any cycle code will display briefly and then be replaced by the time delay display. If any of these devices are still active, that display will remain until the device clears. In the case of multiple devices, the display will alternate between all cycle devices. When the cycle code expires, the display changes to D1, which is the normal time delay. Minimum time delay is two seconds. At the end of the time delay, the closed cycle begins with closed speed CS display. Closed check is indicated by a CC display, followed by closed cushion, which displays as CU. When the door is fully closed, the display returns to the static code. Stop there just for a second. The C2150 control has enough. I, I just want to add one more thing. So we saw the display, how it was flashing through the different codes saying, ID, EA, SB, you know, indicating all the signals it was receiving. And it also talked about when you activate the door, door goes open, just before, as soon as it gets open, it, it flashes the display as where it got its activate signal from. So from a troubleshooting standpoint, Real helpful. it's very helpful. That way you, you know by looking at the display where the activate signal originated. So you you have a, a, a an activation device for some reason that's triggering when it shouldn't or if you have a safety beam that's holding the door open but the other thing we didn't put in here 
at that part that I thought would be helpful is if the door is experiences a reverse signal, meaning the door is closing and it gets interrupted, it gets stopped, and then it has to reverse open, that display will be RV, indicating that the reverser caused it to open. Or if you happen to press the down button, which will cause the door to open, it will have the DN will display. So there are a couple of other displays, and all of that is in your book. In the uh, either in the diagnostic display readout or the adjustable parameters, every single thing that could possibly show here is going to be in that book, except for the ones that aren't there. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that you know, I didn't want to hold the video when we were watching the video earlier. We kept seeing an OS with a blinking dot behind it. I can't tell you how many times you know, I get a call. I said, well, it's just got an OS. I said, well, does it have a blinking dot? Well, yeah. I said, well, look at LED number four for your toggle. Is it on or off? Uh, off. I said, so you're in the program mode because your toggle circuit is on. You can get that same OS with the blinking dot by double clicking the set button. But the, the blinking dot behind whatever, it doesn't have to be OS, it could be anything. But that blinking decimal point is an indication that you're in the program mode. Right here, the blinking yeah. decimal right here. It's not, not there. But that's up. But there, the point is, there's a lot of diagnostic information available in this control on the two seven segment displays. And, and every bit of it is in your book. That's why it's so important for you to have that book with you when you call in so we can take you to that section and, and help guide you through it. Parameters to adjust functions and select options. These parameters can be accessed by two different methods. When the toggle switch is off, the control goes into program mode as is indicated by the blinking decimal point behind the display, usually OS. The toggle LED extinguishes when the toggle circuit is open. Double clicking the set button is a shortcut to parameter access. The blinking decimal point is the same, but the toggle LED remains on. With the display in program mode, press and hold set to display the current value of the parameter. If no changes have been made since initialization, these values will be the factory default. To change value, press up or down while holding the set button until desired value is displayed. So he's, he's changing the closed checks to save now. changes made in parameters. Return to normal run mode by double clicking the set button or resetting the toggle switch depending upon the method used to enter program mode. 2D should display. Press and hold set button until DS is displayed. Stop the following parameters are so when you So when you make changes, when you make changes to the 2150, change speed, of open speed, close speed, open check, close check, open cushion, close cushion, time delay, any of the electronic digitally adjustable uh, changes that you make, if you want to save those, you want it to stay that way, you have to press and hold the set button until DS data save displays. So even now, after that, if you lose power to the door and when it comes and the power is restored, Everything you've saved will be saved. If you don't save all that, it's going to resort to whatever was saved last time by the guy that worked on it before you. Don't you have to turn <coughs> it out of program logo to save the data? You do. Yeah, that's yeah. why you have to double click to get it there and then hold it down. And then yes, it yes. You do it from 2D. We do get the call every so often where somebody goes back and the door is running in cycle test. And they manually took it out of cycle test, but they didn't do a data save. So whenever you manually take it out of that, you gotta remember, go back in there and do that one last save, or you're gonna get a, you know, next time they have a power outage, the door's gonna come back up and it's gonna be cycle testing. Linear and belt drive operators. OS for open speed default is set to 10. CS for closed speed default is set to 9. OC for open check default is set to 4. CC for closed check default is set to 4. OU for open cushion default is 3. CU for closed
closed cushion default is three. D1 is for the full open time delay. Default is two seconds. D2 is partial open time delay. Default is two seconds. CT is the on-off parameter for cycle test, which causes the door to cycle open, then close repeatedly. Default is off. <coughs> So a lot of times on an install, you get the first door going, you want to go to the second door, you can put the first door on cycle test and just let it sit there and run for a few hours just to, you know, loosen up weather strip or something. Uh, so you have that uh, cycle test ability to let the door run while you're doing something else. When it's in cycle test, it still responds to motion detectors, so you're not going to run over your public if, uh, you know, if you put it in cycle test, if it sees somebody, it'll go back open this door out here is in cycle test so you're not AS is the on off parameter that controls the auto seal feature which attempts to close the door every 15 seconds default is off for reduced acceleration. Default is off. PF is the open close parameter that determines whether the door opens or closes upon power failure when equipped with a power fail module. Default is open. PN is the on off parameter that will inhibit power fail open when the control is in the night mode. This prevents loss of security after hours. Default is on. SL is the on-off parameter that selects a slower table for opening speed. Default is off. So the only thing you did was change the SL parameter. Now you see it selects a, well, it doesn't look that much slower. CB is the on-off parameter that inserts a breaking routine between close speed and close check during the close in cycle. Default is off. Stop, stop the tape. What, what was the question now again? For the acceleration, um, you said you're using uh, three pulse encoders? No, this is a no, this is an eight pulse encoder. Eight pulse. Okay. <coughs> so now you're getting the We early, early encoder-based doors used a three-pulse encoder, but now, now is everything eight-pulse, Jim? Yeah, everything's eight. BR is the on-off parameter that controls the action of the door when an active signal is received during the closing cycle. With the parameter set to on, the control breaks before reversing. When it is set to off, the control goes directly from closing voltage to opening voltage. Default is off. <coughs> LL is the on-off parameter that is automatically turned on if a lock is present during the initialization mode. Default is off. SA is the on-off parameter that indicates whether the lock in previous LL parameter is fail-safe or fail-secure. This is automatically detected and set during initialization. Default is off. 
UL is the on-off parameter that is turned on when an unmonitored lock, such as a mag lock, is used with the C2150 control. This issues a delay between the time the activate signal is received and the door actually open. Default is off. DL is the on-off parameter that causes the lock to engage after each cycle, regardless of day or night one-way setting. Default is off. L1 is the on-off parameter that locks the door whenever the control is in the one-way mode. Default is off. SP is the on-off parameter that is turned on when side light sensors are used. This parameter puts the door in check speed when the side light sensors detect a person in the opening path of the door. Default is off. NA is the on-off parameter that prevents unauthorized access to the programming mode. When NA is turned on and the toggle switch is open, the display shows NA and no access is given. A keystroke sequence, set, set, up, down, is required to obtain access. This can be used as a password to access the parameters. When toggle is restored, access is restricted again. NA can be turned off and a data save performed to remove this feature. That way if you want to keep your hospital people out of, out of your door, you can block them lock them out of control access. When a C2150 version 10 is used with a linear operator, only the parameters that apply to the linear operator are loaded into the parameter table. The door position is indicated by open, open check, and close, close check limit switches in the linear operator. Two parameters are unique <coughs> to the linear configuration. LT is an on-off parameter that provides long intervals for the slide panel to reach open check before the TO display illuminates. This parameter is only turned on when used with long stroke slow opening slide doors. BT is an adjustable timer that determines the time period that the control breaks during the opening cycle. The factory default is 20, which is two tenths of a second. Heavier, faster moving slide panels may require a longer period of breaking whereas a lighter panel may require less to avoid hesitation. Linear drive operators need to run the learn cycle following installation. This establishes the type, linear drive in this case, resets the factory defaults, and identifies and stores lock information. Always push the door slowly from fully closed to fully open, and back to check for any mechanical issue or other obstructions before applying power. Set the jumpers to linear drive setting with jumpers connected to both pins. Turn the toggle switch on and check for the toggle LED, which is the fourth LED on the left hand side of the controller. Hold down the set and reset button simultaneously. Then release the reset button while holding the set button. The display should blink 10, then double zero. When SU displays, release the set button. TY will show briefly, followed by a 3, which is the factory default for this parameter. Press the down button until 0 appears. That determines the program will be set to linear drive. When 0 is displayed, press the set button. The lock light will turn on, followed by lock monitor if a fail secure lock is present. Control will display SE, followed by DS for data setting. How did it get stuck on SE before? Lock monitor Pause. light should already be on if fail safe lock is in place. When lock light comes on, lock. So repeat that, Jim. I've had it get stuck on SE before, and there was nothing there. Oh, there was no. <coughs> I, the 
there's only one more, but uh, it's, it got stuck on S. That's not ringing a bell for me, Jim. Mm -hmm. The only time you see SE is during the lock setup, and it indicates a fail secure lock, which means that you would have no lock monitor light lit up whenever you pulse the lock light to, to check the status. There would have to have been a short or something to, to turn on the, in other words, the only way to, to, for it to recognize a fail secure lock is lock light comes on followed immediately by the lock monitor indicating that there's a lock out there and it's a lock and it's a fail secure lock. Uh, I've, never, I've never seen it get stuck. I, could have, I don't know whether even lock was, and we'll be talking about locks in a little bit, but basically your lock light is an output going to the lock and the lock monitor is an input from the lock. And in order to, to display SE, you're gonna to have to have a response from the lock. So I, I don't know what to tell you on that. Uh, I've never, I've never gotten, gotten a call like that. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. A monitor light will go out. Control will display SA followed by DS or data save. Regarding the, the lock in the 2150 and data saves, the, the, this is the only feature that the control saves on its own. So when it goes through a startup, it saves this information on the fly. It's the only information that it saves on, on its own. So if you make changes, you have to do the data save manually. But this is the only part of that control that will save on the fly. Well, it's also saving the stroke. Yeah. Saves a stroke too. Stroke in the lock. <laughs> if no lock is present, the lock light will come on briefly and the control will display NL for no lock followed by data save. After the previous sequence, the control will drive the door to the fully closed position and display 2D. Initialization is now complete. The next two steps are very important safety items and must be completed before releasing the door for public use. Travel block adjustments are made during the diagnostic routine, which causes the motor to run in the closed position, ignoring safety sensitivity and all other opening inputs. The door should be placed in the closed position. Press and release reset while holding both the up and down buttons. The motor should cause the drive rod to spin in the drive block while displaying alternate zeros. Pull the door from the jam and insert a force gauge. The closing force should be set to approximately 28 pounds tension on the block drive screw springs. When the adjustment test is complete, press reset to clear drive block function. Cycle the door open using the down button. As the door starts to close, use a force gauge to stall the door. Do not allow the door to impact the gauge as inaccurate high reading will result. Adjust sensitivity at R10 until recycle occurs at 15 to 20 pounds. It will be necessary to avoid tripping the motion detectors or safety beams during this test. To manually test micro switches, press and release the reset while holding the down button down. The display will show 10, then double zero. Pause, and then show UT. CL should display when the door is fully closed. CC for closed check when the door is partially open. Go blank in the middle of its travel. OC should display when the wheel carriage hits open check switch. OP should display when the door is fully open. If more than one switch is active, the display will rotate. It is impossible for the door to be open and closed at the same time, though OP, CL, OP, CL indicates a problem. Now, let's assume that we have a false OP reading and we'll trace the circuit through the micro switch lace. Starting with the black wire on pin four of CM11, we trace it to the common connection of the open cutoff switch. That arm is not depressed, so we should have continuity through the normally closed contact of the open cutoff switch. 
There's a red jumper that connects to the column of the open check switch. The arm of the open check switch is not depressed, so we should have continuity through the normally closed contact of the open cutoff switch with a return to the control on the green wire that terminates on pin 2 of CN11. To perform the function test, press and release reset while pressing down and set. Display will flash FT and then display the micro switch location. Pressing up and down alternately will cause the door to open and close while displaying door position. This tests motor function as well as micro switch display. Anybody know about that and use it? Pressing the set button will cycle Pause. the lock. If you want to know if anybody knows about using that, yeah, who, who that uses that in the test field? To test for to see if all the micro switches on a linear drive are are working. Yeah, and it also checks the motor. You know, so it's a it's a dual purpose test. So you, if your motor's not working, you can use that test and. You can also, instead of pushing it through to, to see all the different uh, switch settings, you know, the motor does it for you. That we've got a similar thing on the encoder end of it that actually counts encoder uh, pulses. Now, can you show me the micro switches again with the ugly yellow lines on it? Be on the ugly yellow line. There you go. Okay. This is a throwback to the early, early, early. Uh, linear drive and most people think when a switch trips it makes a contact but what we're doing here is when the door gets fully fully open or fully closed this switch opens and it opens a circuit and back in the old days that actually opened the motor uh, the motor circuit and that's what made it quit it's still that way on the window and then when you go back the other way, it goes it goes till it hits the closed check switch, and then the return goes from from one wire to the other. And then when you get to the closed cutoff switch, that's that circuit opens and the door quits quits moving. And so a lot of people have a mistaken uh, idea of, of how the thing works, but it, it's basically two closed circuits that open when the door reaches its full full open or full closed position. And we did that, you know, we could have done it the right way with the 2150 because we, we had a microprocessor and all that. But in the effort to make everything retrofitable, we wanted to be able to take a 2160-2 uh, and put a 2150 in it without changing anything. So that's, that's how we got that. Pressing up and down alternately will cause the door to open and close while displaying door position. This tests motor function as well as micro switch display. And how do you get to that function again? Up and down together. Uh, no. no. Set and down. What you do for the way I remember it is it, it, what you would do if you were doing a reset or going to the diagnostic stuff. So, Setting down together when you press and release reset takes you to function test. Okay. Pressing the set button will cycle. The That's in the book too, on the towards the towards the back. Press reset to return to normal operation. The set button also allows you to test the lock. Okay. When a C twenty one fifty version ten is used with a belt drive operator, only the parameters that apply to the belt operator are loaded into the parameter table. Door position is indicated by an encoder that is connected to the back of the motor. Belt drive operators need to run the initialization cycle following mechanical installation. When the type is selected, the appropriate data is loaded into the factory default. See the type table. Always push the door slowly from full close to full open and back to check for any mechanical issues or 
other instructions before applying power. The following parameters are unique to belt drive operators. Type 1 through 4. AN is an on-off parameter that limits closing speed to ANSI standard. Default is on. When the AN parameter is restricting the closing speed, CL will be displayed on control. during fine close is an on-off parameter that if turned on overrides the motion detector safety beams during setup or after power failure allowing the door to reach FC without interruption. When this parameter is turned off, which is the default, a motion detector safety beam input caused the control to abort the FC routine and display PD until the input clears when it returns to the FC routine. JS Jam sensing is an on-off parameter that defaults to on. When the C2150 receives an open command, the microprocessor immediately monitors the encoder pulse. If no pulses are received in a quarter of a second, the control assumes the door is jammed or locked and abandons the open routine and displays JS as an error code. RP, reverse on loss of pulses, is an on-off parameter which is factory defaulted to on. This parameter causes the door to recycle to the open position if the encoder loses pulses during the closing cycle. BT is the brake type on belt drive operators. Three is the most forceful braking routine with zero being the mildest. Default will vary with the type selected during setup. OB is the opening obstruction parameter. The C2150 samples the pulse rate every quarter of a second during opening. If the door encounters an obstruction, the pulse rate will slow. Sensitivity of this change is selected by a 0 to 3 parameter. Factory default of 3 is the most sensitive, and 0 is off. TY is the type. This parameter can be changed within the belt drive family 1 through 4. But to change from belt to linear, you must do a relearn. CP is the open checkpoint in inches. Factory default is 75% of full stroke. It is adjustable from 50% to 90% of full stroke. A 36 inch stroke would be factory defaulted to 27 inches and could be adjusted from 18 to 32 inches. PO is the partial open stroke in inches. It is factory defaulted to 8 inches and can be set up to 100% of full stroke. Set jumpers to belt drive setting with jumpers connected to only one side of the jumper block. Turn toggle switch on and check for toggle LED, which is the fourth LED on the left-hand side of the control. Hold down the set and reset button simultaneously. Then release the reset button while holding the set button. The display should blink 10, then double zero. When SU displays, release the set button. TY will show briefly, followed by three, which is the factory default for this parameter. Select type from table. Press up or down button until the correct type appears. Press the set button. The lock light will turn on, followed by lock monitor if a fail secure lock is present. Control will display SE. FC for finding close will display. Door will drive to the full close position. Then close monitor LED will illuminate. FO for finding open will display and the door will drive to the full open position. TS for total stroke in inches will display. DS for data save will display followed by D1. The door should now drive closed and display 2D. C2150 control depends on the encoder for information on door location, direction, and speed. Encoder diagnostic is available to test encoder function. To perform encoder test, press reset and down together. Release reset display should show 10, then double zero followed by ET for encoder test. One segment from each display should display. Push the door open manually. Segments will rotate in counterclockwise rotation. Close the door manual. 
segments will rotate in clockwise rotation. Press reset to return to normal operation. Here's your function test. To perform a function test, close the door fully, press down, set, and reset together. Release reset display should show 10, then double zero followed by FT for function test, then zero. Press and hold the up button. The door should drive open with the encoder counting up. Press and hold the down button. The door should drive closed with the encoder counting down. Press the set button to cycle the lock. Gordon Auto Locks are configured differently to work with different operators, but are fundamentally the same. Linear drive fail safe auto lock solenoid engages to lock the door. Linear drive fail secure auto lock spring engages to lock the door. Two thousand three belt drive fail secure auto lock spring engages hooks to lock door. Two thousand three belt drive fail safe auto lock hooks are turned backwards and solenoid pull in to engage the lock. During initialization, the control pulses the lock output and looks for a change in status of the lock monitor input. On a fail secure lock, a pulse to the solenoid would result in a lock monitor light coming on, which identifies it as a fail secure lock present. If it were a fail-safe lock, the lock monitor light should already be on and would go off when the solenoid was pulsed. Once identified, the lock information would be saved into memory. To test the auto locks, there should always be 27 to 32 volts DC between pins 1 and 5. There should be 5 volts DC between pins 2 and 5 when the lock light is on the control. When the lock is engaged, you should briefly measure approximately 30 volts on the output of the solenoid that will quickly drop to about 10 volts to keep from overheating the solenoid. We appreciate your interest in our training video. All of the information contained in this video is available in print or in our publication H210, available on the Like I said, Two-way traffic is always a pain through swing doors. It just is. <laughs> okay. So next up is the 2150 uh, video.